is finding what God has for me. It is for me. I know without a doubt the Lord will bring you out what God has for me. It is for me. Oh, what God has for me, it is for me. What God has for me, it is for me. Let the people of God say amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We always ask you to do several things when you come to the port or whenever you assemble to hear the word of the Lord. We always ask that you come before him thirsty. For he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. We always ask that you come expecting. Don't come to church except unless you are expecting something from God. I expect great things from him. And then we also have an insert in your bulletin upon which you can take notes. The Holy Ghost can bring things back to your memory. 
then we always ask that you pray, not just with me or the person who's delivering the word of God, but that you pray throughout the service that the Lord will touch our hearts and he that hath an ear will hear. Bow your heads with me, Father. Again, I ask that as the windows of heaven are open, as angels are ascending and descending, with prayer requests going up and blessings coming down, that you fail us not today. May your word not return void. Let nothing in my life hinder this word from going forth today. And nothing in the life of the hearer distract them, whereby they miss the seed of God being planted in their hearts so that fruit can be born to the glory of the eternal God our King. It is my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus, chapter 32. We've entitled our message for the morning, The Power of Intercession. The Power of Intercession. All right. Exodus chapter 32. And for those who are visiting with us, we have been preaching a series on the life of Moses and the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. And so today we will continue that study of interest. Exodus chapter 32, and I'd like to start at verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and worship it and sacrifice to it and said, this is your God. Hebrew word there is Yahweh, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now, Jump down with me to verse 19. So it was as soon as he came near to the camp, he, Moses, saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Go over with me to verse 30. Now it came to pass the next day that Moses said unto the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin. But if not, I pray that you block me out of your book, which you have written. 
May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. The power of intercession. Our message this morning begins with a very interesting exchange between Yahweh and his servant Moses. There is a respectful dispute about whose people these folk belong to. If you read the story, and time does not permit me to, to, to exegete it properly and to exhaust it all, but read it. When they first started dialoguing, God says to Moses, your people are acting a fool. The folk that you brought out of Egypt have made for themselves a golden calf. You need to go down and check on your people. Moses then hits the ping pong back to God. And he says, your people that you led out of Egypt, your people. So, so we got a problem here. God is saying that they are your folk, Moses, and Moses is respectfully arguing and disputing with God and saying, they're your people. Now, 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 uh, Israel, because of this, this dispute, in actuality, is disconnected from God. Now, 40 days have passed. And while Moses is up on the mountain receiving hot off the press the commandments of God, the folk 40 days ago, wasn't that long ago, have now molded their earrings and their jewelry, their nose rings, into golden calves so that they can worship him. And, and, and God is upset about it. When you read Patriarchs and Prophets, page 319, Ellen White says, or the Spirit of Prophecy says, God's covenant with his people had been disannulled. He had literally disannulled himself from his people. Their sins had already forfeited the favor of God. Listen to me now. And justice called for their destruction. Justice demanded their destruction. Well, because the wages of sin is what, everybody? The Lord therefore proposed, she said, to destroy them and make of Moses a mighty nation. Now, God told his servant that he was going to destroy all of those people who were rebellious and had built a, a, a calf to worship. And, 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 and he made a pretty good proposition to Moses because he said, look, I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to create a new nation or another nation through you. Now, if, 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 if Moses was not a humble man, he probably would have taken God up on that proposition. Get rid of these folk who've been giving me a headache. Start afresh and anew with me. But because Moses was humble, he did not take God up on that proposal. And I'm going to refer back to Pastor Matthew's sermon last week, and that is this, or when he preached. Every proposal that's good to you is not necessarily good for you. And so Moses did not accept this proposition from God. He knew that, that this was not the best thing for God's people. And so, so, so God got so angry with his people that he literally told them to leave him alone. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, when God tells you to leave him alone, when, when God says that I'm finished with you, when God says to the servant or the intercessor or Moses in this case, don't even come to me 
and pray for them. Leave me alone. Now, now I've done a lot of bad things in my life. And I'm wondering how close I have ever come to God telling Jesus who intercedes for me to leave him alone. I've done some bad things in my life. Sound like I'm the only one. I've done enough stuff to justify God saying, But I'm reminded of a story in Luke 13. That was our scripture meeting for the morning. When the Bible says that a man owned a vineyard and he planted a tree in the vineyard, then after three years he had expected fruit from the tree. And when he went to the tree, the Bible says there was no fruit on it. Then the owner of the vineyard said, cut it down because it's taking up space. But then the one who was the caretaker of the vineyard, y'all ain't hearing me now, interrupted justice and said, don't cut the tree down. Not just yet, not just yet, not just yet. He, he said, let it alone. Now we've gone from leave, it, leave me alone to let it alone. God says, Leave me alone. Cut it down. Now mercy says, let it live just a little while longer. And he said, let me, let me dig it and let me dung it. And then if, if it doesn't bear fruit after that, then come on back and, and, and make your decision after that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you understand what digging and dunging means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Digging means, this is, what, this is what the servant said. Let it alone. And, and digging means that you start turning stuff. Digging means that you start stirring stuff. This, this servant said that I know the tree hadn't done what it ought to do, but, but if you dig around the roots long enough, uh, we might get some activity. See, see, when we ain't doing what God wants us to do, God then starts digging stuff and turning stuff and flipping dirt. Then when that doesn't work, the Bible says that he dungs it. Now, you may not know what dung is, but dung is manure. He doesn't spray Chanel on you. He doesn't put the latest version of Calvin Klein on you. When God wants growth from you, he stirs the root, turns the dirt, agitates your life. Then on the other side, he dungs it. Now, dung it means that he throws stinky stuff on you. Sometime in order for you to grow, God puts some mess on you. In order for you to grow, God stirs and he puts dung on you. In order for you to grow, God allows situations to get stinking. Y'all got quiet on me. I done been into stinking situations. And it has only been for my growth and for my good. God stirs on one hand and then he throws stinky stuff on me on another hand. So that's why when you think you're too cute, you forget where you came from. God will throw some stink on you. Look at your neighbor and say, God will stink you. And I'm glad for somebody interceding in this, this, this fig tree scenario where, where justice wanted to cut it down. And mercy stepped in and said, leave it alone. And, and I'm glad that God in my life has told the, 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 the angel of justice that you ought to leave him alone because I still got some work to do on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, everybody needs an intercessor. Everybody needs a cushion to come between them every now and then. Everybody needs a bumper. Everybody needs some insulation. In your life, you will find situations where 
you are not even able to pray for yourself. And you need somebody interceding for you. You need somebody praying for you. Sometimes you can't even pray. Sometimes you don't feel like praying. Sometimes you don't know what to say. Sometimes you run out of prayers. The ones you tried in the past don't even work anymore. That same old, Father, bless this food that I'm about to receive. That same old, now I lay me down to sleep. When they ain't working for you, you need somebody to step up and say, leave it alone. Let it, let it, let it grow a little while longer. Don't make a decision just yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I'm glad for mercy. I'm glad that I got an intercessor. I'm glad that, that, that God hears Jesus that stands before the Father. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? And say, leave him alone just a little while longer. Interceding. That's what you need from time to time. Somebody praying for you. Now, now I don't want to paint a picture here this morning of God being the boogeyman or he's being the one that needs to have his arm twisted so that mercy can be extended. But you need to know that the scales of justice and mercy has to be balanced. See, don't nobody want to talk about mercy like they talk about justice. See, see justice has to be done. If your wheels are out of line on your car, there comes a point where there has to be a measure of correction or you will burn the rubber off of your tires. There has to be a measure. See, I didn't get an amen on that one. You, you got to have a, a, a corrective measure. And so there's a thing called justice that demands accountability and reconciliation uh, and, and restitution. And that's what justice is. So when God came down off the mountain with Moses, all he was telling Moses is that there is justice that needs to be done. There has to be a correction. Here's what I love what Ellen White says, though. Patriots and Prophets, page 319. Let me alone, she says, that I may consume them. Were the words of God? Listen to this now. But Moses discerned grounds for hope. Justice said we ought to get rid of those individuals who have mowed in a calf and, and, and have replaced me. But she says, Moses discerned a ground for hope. Moses, where did you find a ground for hope? There is nothing in these people's lives that deserves God withholding judgment. Where did you find grounds for hope? Bible lets us know that 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 there was an intercessor on the part of the people. And, and, and I want to really know what grounds Moses found for hope because I might need that same formula one day in my own life. So, so I need to really find out what, 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 what held back the judgment of God from his people. The first thing Moses said was, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Moses is saying, they're not my people. I was doing fine in Midian. Even though I was a fugitive, I had found a pretty good life there, and I found a black girl that I married. Yeah, yeah. And, and we had a baby. Now, granted, I was a, a fugitive, but, but, but I found a pretty good life. I, I found a father-in-law that accepted me for who I was. Uh, you, you know, I, I was running from what I did in Egypt, but uh, I, I still made a pretty good life for myself. Then I was on the backside of the desert in the wilderness, and, and you called me and sent me up on top of the mountain, put me before a burning bush, and you told me to go to Egypt and say, I am has sent me. I was doing all right until you called me. 
And now you're going to tell me that these are my people? Y'all stay with me now. Stay with me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was minding my own business. And, 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 and you're the one called me. You see, see, when you're a sinner, you out there do all that you think you're big and bad enough to do. Then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost begins to scratch on your heart. And then you get this idea that you're going to join the church. And then when you get the idea to join the church, uh, the Satan puts up a fight. And he says, I'm not going to let you go without a fight. And then you get into the church, and it seems like your troubles become more multiplied than when you didn't know him. And when you get in the church, you got to look up to God and say, look, I, I was out in the bars doing pretty good until you called me. <laughs> now I got folk who claim to be Christians. <laughs> acting worse towards me than my buddies when I was in the streets. I, I got folk in the church that's talking about me. And they don't even know nothing about me. But, but, but they claim to be Christians. Uh, I, I'm your person. I'm yours. I belong to you. That's the first thing he had to establish. You got to remind God as though he needs reminding that you belong to him. That I'm no longer Satan's property. I am God's property. See, see, every now and then, I'm talking about a formula here. Every now and then you got to tell God what your last name is. You got to remind God that your name has been changed. You're no longer Jacob, but you're Israel now. Oh, I wish I had a witness here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This must have worked because it, it, it prevented the, 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 the justice of God from, from killing God's people. And the first thing Moses said, well, these are your people. Sometimes we forget who we are. Sometimes we forget that we're God's property and we are his treasure. A -a -a Amen. Sometimes you got to remind him and put it up and say, these are your people and I belong to you. Then the second thing he said, you brought them out of Egypt, not me. When you saw me, all I had was a stick in my hand that I used to, to, to tend sheep and to guide them. And then you put some stuff in the stick. When you put some stuff in the stick, then I was able to part Red Seas and, and, and make water in the Nile turn red. You put some stuff in my stick. Wasn't nothing but a stick before you touched it. So understand that I couldn't bring nobody out of nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and not only that, if it wasn't for you, I'd have never gone back to Egypt. You remember, I killed a man back there. Not only am I your child, and not only did you bring him out of Egypt, but he said, consider the great controversy, Lord God. If you destroy your people here, the age-old argument that's been going on for eons that Lucifer raised was that you're not fair, you're out to get us, you're out to punish us, and every time we do wrong, that's what Satan claimed. Now, if you kill your people out here in the desert, the enemy is going to have the last laugh. I told you that they're going to go out into the desert and starve to death and, and die of thirst. And, 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 and he said, Lord, remember the great controversy. Don't give the enemy the opportunity to have the last laugh. Y'all ain't with me on that one. Let me break it down a little bit for you. When I get on my knees. I recognize that I've messed up a lot of things, and I recognize that I've given up a lot of opportunities, and I ought to be further along, perhaps, than I am today. But when I get on my knees, I say, God, you are a restorer. Yeah. And I'm in this, hey, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And I am in the middle of this controversy. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. And don't you let the devil laugh last on my life. Yeah. Yeah. So don't kill me during the journey. Let me get to the promised land first. You can take my life then, but don't take me out in the middle of the desert because you got to remember the controversy. The devil is the one that said you ain't going to make it. The devil is the one that said you ain't no good. The devil is the one that said you deserve to die. The devil is the one that said there's nothing here. There's nothing going on. There's no fruit. There's no progress. 
There's no advancement. They lukewarm anyhow. But then I tell God, remember the controversy. Don't give the devil the opportunity to have the last laugh. And that got God's attention. He said, you know what, Moses, you might have a point here. Talk, talk to me a little bit longer. Then he says, I want you, Lord, to remember the relationships of the past. Now, stay with me, Church of the Living God. There is a difference between knowing and knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge and still not know God. You can have a lot of knowledge about God and not know God. The people of old did not just have knowledge about God. They knew God, had a relationship with God. Moses borrowed and went back in the past and said, Lord, remember the relationship that you had with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Before you destroy your people, you need to think about the promise that you made to Abraham. Before you destroy your people, think about the promise you made to Isaac, the promise you made to Jacob. Wait a minute. Before you destroy them, think about the relationships of the past. Let me talk to these young folk here who just had a baby blessed. The only reason a lot of times you're still here ain't because you're doing right or doing wrong. The reason you're still here is because somebody had a relationship with God in the past and they prayed for you. So when you veer off to the left or veer off to the right, God remembers the promise that he made to your daddy and your grandmother and your great-grandmother. And that's why we're still here today. Not because we're living right. No, no, no. God remembers the promise that he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Harriet and John and Willie and Susie. Then... Moses told God, remember the covenant. You made a covenant with them. And here is what the covenant is for us in the New Testament. He that has begun a good work in you. Wish I had a witness. Let me try this. Yeah, there's a covenant somewhere in there. He that has begun a good work in you will complete it and finish it until the day of redemption. So when I get weary and my legs get heavy and I feel like a ball and chain is on me and I can't get up, that's what I refer to. I say, God, finish this thing in me. Finish this thing in me. Don't let me die now. Don't let me get weary now. Finish this thing because you promised that you would. Oh, that's a good word. Holy Ghost, if you help me, I'll preach it. Finish this thing in me. Sometimes it seems like God has stopped working on me. When I get silly and I get crazy, I don't feel the mechanic working on me. And I got to dig down deep and say, God, finish the work in me. Don't cut this tree down just yet. Huh? Put some more stink on me if you have to. Dig around my roots if you have to. But don't stop right now. Finish this thing in me because you said you begun it. Now I want you to finish it. Look to your neighbor and say, finish the work in me. Finish the work in me. Moses began to intercede for the people. Then the Bible said that, that, that and this, is, this, this bothers me a little bit, because the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 24, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. That's what Moses said. You ain't been nothing but a headache for me since I met you. You never say nothing good. You're always complaining. And even when you were going through the Red Sea, you were saying, what's taking us so long? Before we get to the other, there's a long walk. And a miracle was around you. Yes, sir. You ain't been nothing but a pain yes, in the glutamus maximus yes, since the day that I met you. Watch this now. But when he comes down from the mountain 
and he's in anger, throws the commandments down. God then begins to say, don't even talk to me about them. Leave me alone. Something began to stir in the heart of Moses that caused him to turn to God. Watch this now. He turns away from the foolishness of the people. The same folk that are stiff-necked, same folk that have been nothing but a headache, the same folk that's been nothing but cantankerous. He turns to God now, and he said, Lord, don't hurt them. God said, leave me alone. Don't hurt them. He says, I know that you're a God of justice, but there's some mercy in you somewhere. And if there's any mercy in you, I need to find it, because you don't need to destroy these people. Watch this now. Then he says, look, I know that, that, that justice demands a correction of the record. And somebody's got to pay for it. This man turns around to God and says, look, if you got to take my name out of the book of life. And exchange it for theirs. I'm willing to exchange my spot in heaven. Let me work with that for a minute. I like y'all. I like y'all a lot. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, 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 yeah. When it comes down to going to heaven, there is a sanctified selfishness about me. There's a sanctified selfishness about me. There's a sanctified selfishness about me that says, if you ain't going, I'm going on anyhow. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this man, this man said, I'd rather for you to take my name out of the book. I'm talking about the power of interceding. Take my name out of the book. I love him. They're pain. Oh, they hurt me. They talk about me in the tent. Yeah, they talk. Why? Well, I can't work this. I, I can't be all day. But they talk about my, my stuttering. They talk about my talking. They talk about, you, you know, my stick. They talk about my leadership style. They talk about, you know, I didn't hear him talking about, you know, he was a murderer. And he ain't got no business. You know, he, yeah, I know that. But Lord. If you can take my name and replace it with theirs. See, there's power in interceding. But, 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 but let me break this on down. Jesus took it further and said in Matthew chapter 5 and 44, he says, you ought to pray for your enemies. And you ought to pray for those who despitefully misuse you. You know, it would have been enough if he had just said somebody misused you. The, God, the Bible had to put despitefully misuse you. That means that when they do something to you, they do it with a, something with a face. You know, like, eh, eh, eh. That's the despite, eh. And Jesus said, you ought to pray for them. Listen, folks, let me tell you something. If I don't like you, and you've done something again, can I get about 10 minutes out of you? I don't even want to talk to you. I don't even want to see you. I don't even want to sit on the same pew with you in the same church on Sabbath. Can I get anybody to say amen? Y'all acting like I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> now, hold on a minute. If I got a problem with you, I don't even want to see you. I don't even want to talk to you. When you tell me, hello, bless God, and happy Sabbath, you really don't want to hear what I want to say back to you. <laughs> Not really. And Jesus turns around and tells me, to pray for you. The power of intercession. Pray for you. That's the last thing that I want to do. But 
God says, you ain't praying. No, no, I'm going to lay something heavy on you now. God did not say that you have to love or like somebody in order to intercede for them. See, we got it twisted. We think that I got to forgive you first and then get my mind right first. And then I can pray for you. No, 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 wait a minute. Jesus said, those who persecute you, misuse you, hate you, and are your enemies. Folk, if you all that to me, I don't like you. If you all that to me, I don't love you. Jesus knew that when he said the scripture. And he said, it's not a requirement, it's not a prerequisite that you like somebody in order to intercede for somebody. If that was the case, nobody would be prayed for. You get the blessings of praying for folk Why, when you pray for them, when you don't like them. Oh, I ain't got but a few people that got it over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where your blessing comes from. See, when you get to the point to where I can pray for you, not myself, I'm praying for you. Not that God puts a boulder on your head, not that God kills you and puts you in an accident or break your leg or your neck. When I pray genuinely for you, that's some hard stuff. Lord, I know they owe me some money. The reason I'm about to lose my car is because of them. I know he took my wife. That's why we're divorcing. I, 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 I know, I know, I know, I know. God says, that's who I want you to pray for. Y'all ain't getting this? Don't you know we, we normally don't do that? We packing pistols, <laughs> finding the nail to scrape the car, the knife to punch the tires. But God said, no, 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 put the nails up, put the tires up, put the, no, no, no. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to intercede for them. No, 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 no. I don't mean a nursery rhyme prayer. No, no, now I lay me down to sleep. I want you to intercede for them. Well, why must I do that? Because they can't do it for themselves. Why well, they're not doing what they ought to be doing, you know better. And I got you covered. So I want you to get on your knees and I want you to intercede for them and ask the Holy Ghost to move on their heart and change their minds and to convert their spirit. That's what God wants. But see, we get in the church, you ain't said nothing to Harry on this side for five years. In fact, if you don't like somebody, you don't even change your membership from that church and go to another church. And then God says, you can go as far as you want to go, but you better still pray. See, see, there's something about the power. Hold on, Rocky. There's something about the power of intercession. That, that when I'm praying for you, God is doing something for me. See, 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 in a marriage, you, you know, when things ain't going right, when I'm praying for you, huh? Even though you ain't treating me right. You, you, you know, you, 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 we don't sleep in the same room. You don't cook no more for me. You don't say good morning. You don't do nothing, but it don't matter. When I'm praying for you, Something begins to happen to me. Then I learn to love you unconditionally. Even when you ain't doing nothing to deserve it. That's what Moses did. You get to the point to where you want somebody else to go to heaven in front of you. Look, 
I ain't there. I'm not there. I'm not there. I wish I could stand here and tell you that if God gave me a choice between me going and y'all going, y'all stand. So, honestly, honestly. But the more I pray for you, the more I, I, I give to you, the more I work for you, the more I'm a servant for you. I get to the point on the humility when, when, when Moses was, where I'm willing to change places. See, parents understand this. That you'll give your life for your children. But that's your children. What about your enemy? What about the person you don't like and the person that don't like you? And the more you try to like them, the more obstinate and the more rude they become. That's when God started doing something. The Bible says in the last book of Joel that when he prayed for his friends, God gave him more in the end than he had in the beginning. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They were his friends, but they were not on friendly terms. How do you know? They were the same rascals that talked about him. They were the same rascal that questioned his faith. They were the same rascal that questioned his integrity. They were the same ones. And yet God says, stop praying for them. Yeah, but they're talking about me. Pray for them. But they're talking about me. Pray for them. There's power in intercession. And what I'd like for the church to start doing is do less complaining and more interceding. Roger, you can make your way to the piano now. What I like for the church to do is to start saying, look, you got a problem? My problem is insignificant now. Why? Because I'm interceding for you. We want to get to the point to where the moment we begin to hear that somebody ain't doing well in our church, I stop praying for myself. See, the problem is that when we come before God, we got a long list of stuff for me. Do this and, and do that and do the other. God says the moment you hear one of the members of the church that's wounded and broken, put your list aside and focus your intercession on that person. Ladies and gentlemen, if we did that in the church of God, we would have nowhere near the problems that we currently have. When I hear about your marriage, mine then becomes insignificant. When I hear about your children, the problems that my children have becomes insignificant. When I hear about your bills not being paid, I ain't worried about paying mine now because the power of intercession is that of Moses. Take my name out of the book. In fact, God, I rescind all of my requests. And if you can just take one of my blessings and give it to the person who is in need. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we ain't trying to give up no blessing. Oh, we want everything we can get. Y'all do you know that's the new thing now. Make a touchdown, make a field. Hey, give me some love. God wants the kind of spirit that says my problems are insignificant now. I'm willing to change places with you. And folk, when you get down on your knees and pray for that person that is an enemy that despitefully misuse you, that you don't like, God ain't talking about hitting your knees. You know, one of those like you, you know, in the morning, bam, I'm out of here. No, he talking about getting down there and putting a pillow under your knees. And say, I'm going to be here for a while until you get your healing. Huh? Until you get your blessing. Huh? Until your marriage is straightened out. Huh? Until your car starts running. Huh? Until something comes into your bank account. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying this morning. There is power. Oh, my 
about God. When we hear about somebody else's situation. Oh, I heard that Mary, your daughter, is pregnant. She came all up in here in church and act like a virgin. The power of intercession means that you start saying, Lord, whoever and whatever is in her womb, I pray that you anoint that child, that they might become an instrument in your hands to fight against the enemy from this day forward. Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus that he or she becomes a mighty warrior, a mighty king and a mighty queen for you. See, when you got that kind of power of intercession, Instead of talking about somebody, I heard their marriage ain't doing too well. <laughs> yeah, they come up in church every Sabbath and put on a front, put on a show. I knew they weren't doing good anyhow. When you change that to say, Lord, create in that marriage your image to your glory. No. Stop hating on people. Stop not wanting folk to be better off than you. That's one of the reasons why you can't pray in an accessory prayer for people. You scared they gonna get more than what you got. You scared their testimony gonna be louder than yours and longer than yours. You stop hating on people and you got a mindset that Moses had. If you gotta take from me to give to them, they can have every blessing that's in the queue or in the line that's waiting for me. Give it to them. Oh, I got to close. I thank God for mercy that tells justice, don't cut the tree down. I thank God for Jesus that if justice says, leave me alone, mercy says, leave him alone because I got some work to do Lord don't leave me by myself because if you leave me by myself I'm going to mess up myself I surrender my heart and my mind to you and give this tree just a little more time just a little more time dig me dung me stir me stink me do whatever you got to do in order to save me, but don't give up on me. 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 My Father and my God, I thank you for justice. I know stuff got to be made right. And I know the records got to be made straight. I know restitution and reconciliation is required. But I ain't got nothing to pay you with. I don't have nothing to show for it. I ain't got nothing in my own life that's worth anything. But, but listen to the voice of grace and mercy that comes through the vine dresser. That says leave that tree alone just a little while longer. And I'll do some work on it that needs to be done. And if you give me a chance, I'll, I'll turn it around and I'll fix it. Then come back next year. And if it ain't bearing no fruit, you can cut it down then. But right now, allow me to give it some TLC, some tender love and care. Thank you for interceding for me, Jesus. Thank you for holding out on me and not letting justice have its way. I thank you that mercy comes and kisses his justice and gives me an opportunity to make it right one more time. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Is there anybody in here who needs mercy today? Anybody in here who is under the condemnation of justice, meaning you've sinned and you know you're wrong and you ain't got nothing really to give God in exchange, but you want to take the blood of Jesus. You want to say, Lord, intercede for me. Don't let justice take me out. Give me a little while longer. And I want to make that decision today. Anybody here raise your hands and say, Lord, Jesus, please, give me just a little more time. 
Don't leave me alone. What is it, Elder? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I want to bless. I want to thank you. And praise you too. Why? Your grace, Your grace and mercy. mercy it, brought it brought to me. One more time while they fill out the cards there. Just raise your hand. Your grace and Justice, justice wants to get rid of me. Justice says, leave me alone. God's mercy and his grace comes and says, give him a little more time. Give him a little more time. So the Holy Ghost can work on him. Because of you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. That grace and mercy, your grace and mercy again. I like that. <laughs> your grace and mercy. Oh, yeah. You brought me through. There's power in and of seed. God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. Remember the covenant. Remember the promise. Remember that we're yours. Remember that you brought us out. Remember the promise that you're going to take us through unto the end. He who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of redemption. That's my prayer. That's his promise for you.